Welcome back. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, sorry to the Zoomers for the slight interruption in the sound uh, during the first bit of Susie's talk. Uh, you would have all been crying anyway, so don't worry about it. Um, the next half of the programme, what we've decided is uh, the space at the end after the scheduled talks, uh, then when we've got comments from the floor, Ken will come up and do things. So uh, we have uh, three talks today from Louise Teixeira, uh, Graham Cameron, then uh, Tom Kaufman is going to join us via Zoom. Then we'll finish with uh, um, a short piece from Ken about uh, Michael's time at Churchill, and then uh, uh, invite anyone that wants to make some comments um, that hasn't spoken. And for those of you that are joining us for dinner, if you'd prefer to keep comments that may not be suitable for public broadcast um, <laughs> to while the port's been passed around later, then you will, of course, be very welcome to do so. So without uh, further ado, it's a, a pleasure to welcome uh, Louise Teixeira. Um, who is at uh, the Institute Golbenkia and uh, Katalika Biomedical Research Centre. Uh, I remember when Luis came and joined the lab and he just told me it took him six months to understand a word he was saying. So uh, it's your turn to speak now, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Steve. I'll try not to talk like you. Yeah? <laughs> not curse as much. So... Um, so good afternoon, I'm Luis Teixeira, and uh, I was a, a postdoc with Michael from uh, 2005 to 2009. And uh, um, it has been great to hear all the talks until now, and uh, um, um, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. I'm very happy to meet uh, friends. Uh, at the same time, it's very humbling because I, I did not participate in all these big endeavors of, of Michael. Yeah? all these big projects and, and big achievements. Uh, I just contributed with a very small uh, part of, of his work. But on the other side, he contributed immensely to, to me, to my research and, and to my career. And uh, probably as many postdocs and uh, other people that pass through his lab, uh, it is a collection of small uh, events that uh, uh, give rise to the to his influence on, uh, on, uh, on our uh, research. So I'll try to go through uh, some of this. Um, so I met Michael actually 20 years ago in uh, 2003 in a European Drosophila Research Conference in Gottingen. Um, so I, I, I was finishing my, my PhD and uh, I, I had something I wanted to pursue out of my PhD, the connection between the gene that I was studying, uh, Slobo, and, uh, and immunity. And uh, I was told that Michael uh, accepted sometimes postdocs to go to his lab and to pursue their, their projects. So, so I, I approached him at, at the conference uh, to discuss this possibility. Um, he came to my poster, I discussed what, what I was doing. And, uh, and a few months later, I came here to Cambridge to, to have an interview with Michael and to discuss the possibility of doing a postdoc. So when I arrive uh, in the at, uh, late morning uh, to the Department of Genetics for this interview, Michael uh, immediately invited me to, to go out and go for lunch. Uh, he fetched Steve to go for lunch with us. And uh, we went to uh, Pizza Express just around the corner um, of, of the Department of Genetics. And it's still there. This is yesterday. Um, and, and we had lunch. And uh, as we were having lunch, Michael explained to me uh, what was being done in his lab, uh, what, uh, what uh, was being done in Steve's lab, what was being done in general in the Department of Genetics. And then he asked me, when did I want to start? <laughs> and, and that was it. That was the interview. Uh, I, I didn't give a talk. Uh, so actually, I, I asked him, don't you want to hear what I want to do? And he said, OK. And he obliged me and listened to me. And, uh, and they told me, okay, I can, I can come into the lab um, and start when I finish my, my PhD, but I need, I need to get a fellowship at least, um, and, then, and then I should get a, a project to, to do uh, what I wanted to do. Um, and, and this uh, liberty and, and actually responsibility to, to now do something uh, uh, with this freedom, uh, actually it was, it was a crucial moment for me because 
I started to write the grant the, the fellowship applications, and then I realized that the project I had in mind actually was was not good. Uh, it was weak. It was easy to to file. Uh, it, it had flaws. So then I had to think deeply about what to do with this uh, opportunity. Uh, I realized what I liked about the other project was immunity in Drosophila, and then I, I thought about what what could be done that was new in the field, and uh, um, so I wrote a fellowship to to work on Drosophila antiviral immunity, which there was uh, very little done, almost nothing was done at that point, and uh, so I got the fellowship and uh, and I started uh, to work. Um, in the lab, and then we had to write write a grant with with Michael, and we wrote a, a BBSRC grant, and uh, uh, it was a, a great learning how to do this. So uh, Michael's uh, suggestions, uh, his editing, um, and the way how to write uh, a grant uh, really um, made a huge difference. And uh, until this day, I still. I still write grants uh, following more or less the same uh, structure and logic um, of, of that uh, BBSRC grant. Um, also, um, in, I don't know if it's still true, but at, the point, at that point, uh, reviewers' comments were, were, were brought back to the authors, of the, to the applicants uh, of, of the grant, and we had a chance to, to answer to them. And we did answer and address uh, systematically all the, all the points raised by, by the reviewers uh, in, in great detail. But uh, one reviewer actually wrote that, uh, that uh, they were uh, concerned that we did not have experience in drosophila immunity and maybe we could not uh, uh, perform what the, the work that was written in the grant. Uh, and to, to that, Michael answered, uh, Michael, took care of that answer and just answered, this is not rocket science. <laughs> and, and, and this was really a, a learning a, a lesson to me. Uh, because you, you, in this review process, uh, be it grants, be it papers, you do address all the scientific questions and you give uh, 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 the answers on trying to solve the, que the scientific questions. But there are limits in this conversation. and, and uh, there's a limit to the power of the reviewers and you should uh, answer each, each point, uh, maybe in a different way, depending on the, on the scientific content of the point. Um, on the other side, I also learned uh, lessons uh, from Michael. So one, one case, uh, we had, uh, Michael received a paper from PNAS to review, so this was one of those um, uh, submissions from the members of the National Academy of Science, so they go directly uh, to review um, with chosen uh, reviewers. Michael got one of these um, and was related with what, what I was doing, so he, he invited me to review with it. And after I read it and I took some notes, I went to his office to, to, to write the review with him. And, um, well, impressively, as we're discussing the, the, the paper, Michael is writing the review at the same time as we're discussing it, and he writes it from beginning to end perfectly well, with logic and uh, all the points taken. I don't know how, how you could do that. Um, but, um, but it was a negative review. So the, the paper has some flaw. We pointed out and we, we rejected. Um, the, the author of the paper, uh, from, from the correspondence afterwards, I could see he was a, a friend of, of Michael or well known for, to Michael. So the, the author actually wrote back to Michael uh, arguing for, for the uh, reconsideration of, of the rejection. And uh, Michael was just adamant about it. He just said, no, the paper uh, uh, is flawed and uh, that's it, it's, it's rejected. So he was very clear about, um, about the, um, the scientific integrity and very black and white about, about the principles of, of, uh, of doing science. Um, and then actually, some months later, the author wrote back to us thanking us for the rejection uh, because they then dig into the problem and they found something else that was much more interesting and they, they, they published the paper in a much more interesting way. Um, so the, the scientific discussions with Michael, our discussions, uh, were, were at the same time deep uh, and, and also fun. Uh, they were always very interesting um, conversations. Um, 
when, when they were about the, the, the project itself that, that, that I was doing about my, my research, uh, they were very intense. They, they were deep, very intense. Uh, and, and they felt like a ping pong game. Yeah, they were very fast, uh, back and forth, back and forth, about this, about, about that, this, that, 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 and they would finish. Uh, uh, very fast where we would cover um, what, what needed to be covered about the project. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes when we were discussing uh, broader, broader aspects or possible future uh, directions, that, that then we could also see this uh, encyclopedic knowledge of, of Michael that uh, several speakers before had, had, had said that he actually seemed to know everything about, about Drosophila and whatever field uh, we're discussing will point me out the paper from uh, 64, the paper from 72 that I should check which groups were doing what nowadays. Um, so the, the, the project um, it was not rocket science, but, but it took a long time to, to, to be built up. So lots of protocols, assays uh, had to be established because we had no experience in uh, Drosophila immunity. Uh, but we did it slowly. Um, and then um, after about, uh, after maybe one and a half years of the project, uh, where everything seemed to be set up, uh, there was a, a crucial point um, of, of, of the research. Uh, so I was... I was doing, um, the part of the project was to do a, a main part of the project was to do a genetic screen uh, to find flies that were more sensitive to, to virus to identify genes involved in antiviral immunity. And at some point I was doing a, a pilot of this. So I was injecting flies with, with virus and I was following survival. And the idea would be to find flies that were much more or much less sensitive to virus than, than control. But the results were that I, 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 I was I, w I was having what were like this, the control line there in black uh, actually behave differently from most of the lines. Most of the lines were much more resistant to virus than my control line. So this was, this was very puzzling. Um, and and it, for me, it was very depressing because it, it really showed that I was not controlling something uh, about this assay. And um, I could not perform a genetic screen. I could not perform the the, the, the grant uh, project, and, uh, and this was already one year and a half uh, towards uh, in the middle of my, my postdoc. So it was very stressful at this point. Uh, and then uh, I had to figure out exactly uh, what was happening, and it took a while to, to work this out. And at some point, I had some indication that what was happening here, the difference between flies, uh, sensitivity to, to virus, had something to do with, uh, with Bobakia. So, uh, Wolbachia uh, are uh, intracellular bacteria um, that are transmitted maternally. So, this is this kind of association between intracellular bacteria mat transmitted maternally and insects is, is very, very common. Almost all insect species have some kind of interaction like that. Uh, but Wolbachia is the, the most common one. It's present up to two thirds of insect species. So, it's, it's all over the place. And, and it was known um, in insect biology uh, because it can induce a very wide range uh, of interesting phenotypes. Mainly at this point, uh, they were about uh, reproductive manipulation of the host, which has to do with this ma uh, maternal transmission. So Drosophila melanogaster also has Bobachia, and, uh, and it's actually present in, a, in all populations that are surveyed. So there's, there's Bobachia all over the place. But... Um, Volbachia did not induce any strong uh, phenotype on, on Drosophila. It did not do the reproductive manipulation that was known to do uh, in, other, in other insects. And uh, there was no good explanation of why Volbachia, how was Volbachia kept in, in, in Drosophila uh, populations in the wild. So when I, I first had this, this indication, it was Volbachia I went to discuss with Michael. Um, and of course, he has the encyclopedic knowledge about Drosophila, so he, he knew everything about Volbachia and Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, he, he knew that there was no strong phenotypes. He had some experience, either directly or indirectly, on some um, experiments on the gene expression, and Volbachia didn't do anything in the fly. So he said he, he would be very surprised if it were Volbachia. Yeah? Um, 
and, and for me, this was great. This was great news. Uh, because if Michael would be surprised by, by Vobakia being responsible for this, then, then everybody would be surprised. <laughs> and, uh, and it would be a great, uh, a great result. And, and with a bit f further experiments, then we could show that uh, indeed it was Vobakia. Uh, so we, if we have the same line without or with Vobakia, they survive to virus in completely different ways. And this is because Vobakia gives resistance to virus. Uh, there's a 10,000 10, fold difference here between flies without and with Vobakia um, uh, when they're infected with Drosophila C virus. So this, this was very interesting, a very strong phenotype of Vobakia. Maybe it could explain why Vobakia was there in the, in the wild populations. Maybe it can explain why Vobakia is so frequent in insect uh, species. And it raises a lot of interesting fundamental questions. Some of them we're still pursuing in, uh, in my lab nowadays. Um, it also had a, a, a very strong and fast practical application because the, the group of, um, of Scott O'Neill in Australia, they were actually placing this same Vobakia, the Vobakia of Drosophila monogaster, into Aedes aegypti uh, for a different purpose. Um, and Aedes aegypti uh, is the main vector of dengue, of uh, chikungunya, uh, nowadays Zika, uh, and, and yellow fever. And, and if Vobakia would give protection in mosquitoes, that could be very interesting. And it does. So actually, Vobakia gives very strong protection against uh, dengue and the other virus uh, in mosquitoes. And, and this is important because if the mosquitoes don't get infected, they don't transmit uh, the disease. Um, so, so there's several efforts in the world to try to bring this to the field. Uh, one of the biggest projects is the World Mosquito Program, which have pilots uh, for these releases uh, in several countries. Um, in the mosquito, Vobakia also manipulates the reproduction of the, mosqui of, of the mosquito. So when you, they, you release enough mosquitoes into an area, then all the population of mosquitoes gets Vobakia. All of it gets this protection against virus, and then it can stay there for years. Uh, uh, for many years, for example, in some of the first pilot releases in Australia, they were more than 10 years ago, and the Vobac is still there. And the, the, the field results of this strategy are starting to come out in the last couple of years, a big, big project. And for example, in uh, Yogi Akart in Indonesia, uh, there is a 77% reduction of dengue in the areas where the mosquito is released compared with others. Uh, some releases in Brazil also have similar results, also in, uh, in Colombia. In some others, it's a bit more ambiguous, the result are not as strong, but it seems like it can be a good strategy to be applied in the field, and the WHO is now considering this as a worldwide uh, application to try to uh, prevent dengue transmission. Okay, so... When it, was, when it was time to publish this, um, the, the Drosophila part of, of, the, of the work, um, Michael, once again, was very uh, uh, straightforward and, uh, and uh, uh, hold uh, to his principles. So, so he told me, you know, you, you can publish this anywhere you want. You publish in any, any journal that you want. But I will only sign it. I will only be an author if it's open access. Okay, so very, very black and white again, very clear about the message. We publish it in PLOS, Plus Biology. And actually, I've, I've been publishing all, all, my, all my papers have been uh, open access um, since then. Um, so I, I took this picture from, uh, um, from the uh, Department of Genetics website because it just shows how joyful uh, Michael was and how joyful it was to talk with him and to discuss with him and, and my time here as a postdoc you know with all, all the stress and turns on the research that are common in, in what we do overall it was a very enjoyable pre years and, and Michael uh, made it possible he was um, was very extremely extremely generous uh, with me 
uh, he, he empowered me, giving me liberty to do what I wanted, at the same time giving me the conditions to do what I wanted. We also had to deal with, with John Root and, uh, and flies and virus, uh, and so we had to solve that. Um, and, and he also gave me ownership of, of the work. Uh, uh, he was also generous when I moved back to Portugal. Uh, I, could, I could take all of this research with me and, uh, and, and continue it. So, uh, uh, Michael's you know, generosity, his clarity, his straightforwardness, uh, and at the same time his down-to-earth attitude uh, have always been um, an example to me. And it's not only about um, th the principles, which are great, but also about the, how we, we made it seem so easy to do. Yeah? Um, I, I think on my naiv naivety when I, when I was here as a, as a postdoc, um, uh, I, I, I just thought it was normal. It was normal and, uh, and I just took it for granted, this, this interaction and this, this generosity. And uh, of course, um, I mean, this, this was normal for Michael. It was just his way of, of being, but that is because he was actually extraordinary. And, uh, and he upheld all of these principles um, all the time. So I, 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 I greatly admired him. Um, I, I, I took much from, from this uh, interaction, and I often recall these and the other episodes uh, um, when I have to face maybe sometimes some decisions or I have to know what is the best way to go forward in, uh, in some circumstances. And uh, it's, it's always nice to uh, uh, re-encounter Michael actually in, in the vast literature uh, that, he, that he wrote. And for example, when we go and have to find something about flies in the, in the Drosophila uh, laboratory handbook, it's always precise, straight to the point, very informative, but you can, you can read Michael out of it many times. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. I'll do my obligatory check for a question like this. Uh, so next up, we're kind of moving on from Michael's experimental work and, um, and, and his uh, science in the laboratory to one of the other major impacts that he's had um, uh, uh, in the world of biology and invite up uh, Graham Cameron, uh, who was one of the founding directors of uh, the European Bioinformatics, along with Michael. So, welcome, Graham. Well, how do you follow all that? The answer is actually quite easily, because Michael's contribution was so broad that there's always something new to say about what he did. Um, that doesn't mean I'll do it well. It just means that somebody could do it well. Um, I, I want to talk about Michael's contribution to the creation of the EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, which, which was located here in Cambridgeshire and uh, is part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. I joined EMBL in 1982, working in the DNA database under Greg Hamm, and I took over its leadership in 1986. Now, I'd never studied biology, um, and so I was kind of in a dangerous situation here. Um, but there, and I think the, probably my old sole strength was my conviction of how important this was. And without Michael, we wouldn't have succeeded. And he's certainly the scientist who contributed most to my career. And there's a period of that period of EBI history that's kind of lost to history. And I want to try and do something to rectify that. I actually met Michael after I joined EMBL, but his influence began before mine, and even before the DNA Data Bank. The, the DNA Data Library was actually the brainchild of, of Ken Murray and John Kendrew, both knighted and uh, both formidable scientists, both no longer with us. John was Director General of, uh, of the EMBL at the time, and Ken was working at EMBL, and they saw the importance of setting up 
a public database of DNA sequences. And they set up a couple of meetings to discuss it at a, at a little place called Schönau, which is a village near Heidelberg. And Michael was, uh, was, was a contributor to that. <coughs> In 1982, John Kendrew hired me as the second employee of the DNA database. And actually, this was all it, it was rather important because the MBL had put down a marker that this was a public activity that was going to be, to be shared. Um, and, uh, and by the time I was involved, it had become quite politicized and it was becoming quite, quite, a, quite a stressful area with Europe in the EC and the EMBL and the NIH discussing how it should go, go ahead. And in, in 1986, EMBL and NIH set up a, a guidance committee for the DNA sequence databases, of which Michael was a member. Um, and I was you know, sort of slightly worried as a non-biologist that he would blow my cover and that I would be in trouble. But actually, he was incredibly supportive from the start, which is typical of him. The EBI was already forming in my kind of mind as, a, as an idea in, in back, back in 1986, and the politics had advanced quite a lot. Um, the, the, there was a concept being banded around by the EU called the European Nucleotide Sequence Center, which they'd discussed with what they called the European information industries, by which they meant people like Elsevier and Springer, and there was a kind of uh, notion that, that, that something could appear on the commercial side to deal with this. And uh, Michael was a strong member of the advisory committee, and he basically was crucial to scotching that idea. Um, he, he basically, um, in, he, he sort of just said, this is not worth discussing. We've already decided how this is going to be got done and, and, and somehow pushed it off the agenda of the meetings. In private, his comments on Elsevier running the databases were a bit stronger and not entirely expletive free, I have to say. But uh, um, that, that, that's uh, uh, So in the next few years, I was running the, the data library, but my obsession was with the creation of the EBI. And, with, and it, this could never have happened without endless input from Michael, both personally and through this advisory committee. We had to convince the EMBL Council that this was a good idea. And after we sho kept shoving versions of a proposal I was writing under their nose, they, th they realized we wouldn't shut up until they said yes. So in, in 1991, they decided to set up the European Bioinformatics Institute, the EBI. Up until this time, it had been assumed that the EBI would be right next to the parent laboratory in Heidelberg. But at the council meeting, a few members, uh, delegations said, hey, wait a minute, not so fast. If you're going to set up a new part of the lab, we want to have a discussion where, where it should be. And so they charged me with writing a call for proposals to host, to host the EBI, which would be sent to the member states, and they'd make bids against this. I couldn't include Michael in that because obviously the UK was going to bid and it would be called a stitch up if, uh, if Michael had been involved in the calls of proposals. So we, anyway, we did this. We sent this, this call for proposals to the member states and Michael choreographed the creation of a bid to host the EBI from the UK. He, uh, he worked closely with John Salston and, uh, and, 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 and got our agreement for funding from the Wellcome Trust and the MRC. Um, the Wellcome Trust then announced their intention to buy the genome campus, what is now the genome campus at Hingston, and locate the EBI there. It was at that point leased as the home for the fledgling Sanger Center, and they were going to build a genome, uh, genome hub on that campus. And without Michael's determination, there would have been no bid for the UBI from the UK. And there were other bids from Sweden, um, which was, uh, and, and, and one from Germany. Um, and we were supposed to, we were charged with setting up a, an impartial evaluation process, which was, impartiality was difficult, but it was kind of blindingly obvious that the UK bid was far and away the best. The Germans kind of assumed it was a pushover from them, that for them that they'd get it. And, the, and the, the Swedes produced a nice bid after the deadline, and the German delegation said, we don't quite con consider materials that came in after the deadline. So, uh, and the reason Michael could do that so well was because he'd been so engaged with the whole development of the concepts of bioinformatics and the EBI concept, and it led to the creation of the UK bid. 
and won the EBI for the UK. There was extensive input from John Sulston and support from John Sulston and, the, you know, and, and generating the support from the MRC and the Wellcome Trust was no mean feat. Uh, so that was the decision to take the EBI and I actually moved to the UK as employee number one of the EBI in 1993. Now, there was still a bit of a problem because I didn't know any very much about molecular biology. I'd just been going on the basis that I knew this was going to be important. Um, and actually, I didn't know that much about informatics either. And, yeah, and here I was kind of representing, EMB, EMB, representing EMBL as the leader of the EBI in the UK, which was kind of alarming. And I'd lost the context of the EMBL scientists, but I was just arguing that this was very important. And uh, by this time, Fortis Cofatis was director general of, of EMBL, and many of the people here will know, have, know, have known Fotis very well indeed. Um, and uh, he's a, a, a collaborator and a personal friend of Michael's. And he established a, a com committee to, to guide the development of the EBI. Actually, I'd become, at this stage, as an angry young man, I used to hate these committees. But actually, the legitimization and the wisdom of the advice this committee gave was enormous. And Michael was a key, key member of that, uh, of that committee. And by now, he was, uh, he was a much-loved friend. Uh, he was local. And he gave me limitless help and service. He, he just, I mean, I, you know, I would all constantly be running into difficulty and I'd phone Michael and he would stop what he was doing and spend half an hour talking to me about whatever problem it was and get no recognition really whatsoever for the enormity of this contribution. Um, I remember one time I was writing something, I think, for the Wellcome Trust that I didn't, didn't I couldn't put together because I didn't actually understand it very well. And Michael did a huge amount of work on it. He said, and then he said at the end, he said, feel free to represent these thoughts as your own. Well, I didn't actually, but uh, you know, it was uh, it was it was an astounding, astoundingly, astounding generosity. Now, the EBI needed a director, and I'd never anticipated being the director, but I was effectively acting in that role. And it was actually hard. The, the, the concept was as yet unproven, um, and no real scientists were foolish enough to take the risk of hanging their career on the EBI. I'd burnt my boats a decade ago. I was going to fall, stand or fall with the EBI. Um, <coughs> finding a director was a challenge. And the EMBL was also challenged at that time as typical politics. Italy was threatening to leave the laboratory. And there was an unwritten message that if the EBI got an Italian director, somehow Italy would stay aboard. And um, there was... Uh, there were, there were dangers from some likely Italian candidates, shall we say. Uh, and Fotis finessed this by appointing Paolo Zanella, who'd been head of, uh, of IT at CERN and was then the leading, leading chair S4 in, uh, on, in Sardinia. Paolo's domain experience made his, his time there a bit limited, but li limited in success. But he, I should say he did start the EBI industry program, which is still flourishing. 1998, Paolo left, and Michael and I floated up to being joint directors of the EBI. Um, and we knew, both of us knew we were placeholders. Michael had every intention of returning to his real home in genetics in Cambridge, um, and, uh, and, and I certainly wasn't competent to be the, the director of the EBI. Um, <clears throat> so we, we still couldn't find anyone who was willing to gamble their career on this, uh, this crazy idea of the EBI, so we muddled on for a while. Um, there was a shortage of funds, so the, the, the research component of the EBI was kind of treading water at that time. Uh, but Michael actually was, was, was keeping the data services and the stuff we were doing honest because he was talking to everybody about what the work, what the work was. At this time, our, our existence was punctuated by a major crisis at the European Union. Up, in, up at, that, at that time, about 45% of our funding was coming from EU grants. And I'd, throughout this time, been writing grants. I wasn't the only person, but we'd, we'd, we'd been writing grants throughout the entire period I've just talked about to add to the EMBL funding. 
1992, the EU decided that we were infrastructure and infrastructure wasn't eligible for research funding. And three, our three major proposals that we put in were all de declined without even considering their content. It was a crisis for EMBL. There was no way it could find the, the, fill the funding gap. So Michael decided to solve this problem. And uh, he contacted over 60 famous scientists around the world and got, persuaded them all to sign up to a letter in a letter to Nature about, uh, about how, how damaging this decision was to European science. Um, and uh, that caused it to go up from the Commission of the EU up to the European Parliament, who then said to the Commission, you got this wrong, can you fix it? And they found another 22 million down the back of the sofa, and they, uh, and they, they created a, a, funding, a major funding proposal for the EBI, which rescued the EBI. And, you're, and, and while I go, and now go on about it, we, we are extremely grateful to the Commission for all the funding they've given us over the years. Michael caused this reversal. If Michael hadn't taken that on, we would have been in a very serious financial trouble that would have threatened the very existence of the Institute. And he single-handedly did it by, 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 by the fact that he knew and, and could talk to all these scientists around the world. He told me he did forge a couple of signatures on it, but he didn't tell me which ones. <laughs> um, now, we've heard a bit already about Michael's involvement in, in, in Flybase. And um, that was actually, in terms of his guidance for us, that was enormously useful. We were database guys. Now, not all scientists are modest, and, uh, and, and a lot of them kind of thought that we, you know, that we were kind of doing this database stuff, but if a scientist had a weekend to spare, they could probably knock something a bit better together than we were, we were doing. And, uh, but Michael had done this kind of stuff. He knew what it involved to actually get organization right and organize it. And, and he was in constant conversation with the people doing this kind of work at the EBI. And he listened to them and he understood what they were about. And it, and, and it was it was very, uh, it, 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 was, it, it, was, it was crucial to the development of the Institute. I, I used, but, but it actually, Susie talked about the, the Go project and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump onto that now, I think, that was basically, I think the first time I ever heard about the Go project was my, when Michael um, talked, it was in the a restaurant on the top floor of a hotel in Tokyo, I think, when I first heard about this. And, uh, and I was extremely skeptical about it. Um, I thought, you know, this is a hugely, you know, it's an ontology, it's a hugely complex, big knowledge space you're trying to represent. And you're trying at the same time to get the cooperation of an enormous community. And I thought, you know, you're just going to get, this is going to be anarchic. Um, and I was wrong, and I was very wrong. Michael, you know, Michael, the, 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 we were kind of, you know, the, the, there was the kind of purest computer scientists who, uh, who kind of dived in, you know, Michael was trying to pragmatically solve a scientific problem, and then there were these people who came in and with all sorts of abstract concepts of what, were, what you should do to do this job well. And, um, and, you know, it was kind of irritating, but Michael didn't say, no, bugger off, I'm going to do it. You know, this, the, he listened to them. He listened to them. And the project, you know, he was willing to engage with the abstract concepts that these people were discussing. You know, he, 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 Michael didn't dismiss things without actually at first understanding them. And, and, and in fact, the, the project gained from that. Um, so, he, you know, I, I, I don't know why I was skeptical. I, you know, because with hindsight, I think it was obvious that, you know, that Michael was, uh, was, was very capable of dealing with that knowledge space and especially gifted in evoking the, the cooperation of the communities involved. <coughs> At last, um, Janet Thornton was, uh, was persuaded to take over the directorship of the EBI and... Uh, and, and, and I carried on the running of services. And under Janet, the, the EBI flourished. And um, under Rolf and you and today, it's an unquestioned success. The only thing I would say for my, my, my conviction that it was important is that I remember when the council agreed to set up the EBI, they suggested that it should have 69 people. I think, they did, they think, I think that 70 was just one too many for them. 
And I remember in 1987 saying to David Lippmann, they're wrong. It will be a thousand people. Give it time, it will be a thousand people. And I still think that's the case. So, you know, I can't overstress how much Michael gave to that, and, and the EBI wouldn't, pro probably wouldn't be here in the UK and wouldn't be what it is today without his contribution. I also want to express my, my affection for him as a person. We worked and travelled together. There was endless banter. It was, uh, it, was, it was great fun. He used to play at being gruff sometimes, but actually he was, he was at core a very warm-hearted per person. He used to do things to embarrass me when we were traveling. We were hanging around an airport bookshop one time and Michael went up to the manager and said, my colleague here is looking for a good dirty book for the plane. And, <laughs> and, and we used to, and I remember we used to, we used to go through fr fr Frankfurt, through Stansted Airport about every, every, almost once a week we would be going somewhere. And uh, one time the company, the, the company that d drove us there was a driver short, and Ken, who owned the company, decided to drive it himself, and he drove us to the airport, but it had changed so much, he got completely bloody lost on the way to the airport with Michael and I in the car. So we get, eventually we got there, got on our plane to Frankfurt, we land in Frankfurt, and, uh, and, and Michael calls up his PA, Jillian, and says, Jillian, could you call Ken and tell him that driver he sent this morning was bloody awful? <laughs> I can't, it was with a heavy heart that I saw Michael leave the EBI. Um, and I, I do want to preserve his, uh, the memory of his contribution to it. And uh, you know, I'm saddened by, I was saddened by his leaving the EBI, and I'm very saddened by his passing. But uh, I take some comfort in the fact that I don't think he'll ever be forgotten. Thank you. <laughs> oh, almost in time for. Um, are we good for Zoom? Oh, oh, we are. So now the miracle of modern technology, as we're all used to after many years of lockdown. Uh, we will have a Zoom presentation from uh, Tom Kaufman, uh, one of the founders of Flybase, and who worked closely with Michael um, for a number of years. So once the guys are ready, we'll zip off with that. Diego is obviously a friend. I think people have been very circumspect in describing Michael's reactions to some things. Um, I guess it's for broadcasting, so. But uh, his language was positively Glaswegian at times. Um, when Jerry and Susie were talking about the notice that went up about the um, fly genome on the NCBI website about not for distribution, <laughs> my, uh, yes, my bench was outside his office. Oh. Ah! Oh good, my God! Good morning, Tom. <laughs> good morning. How are you? Well, I'll just introduce you, Tom Kaufman, who's joining us from Indiana. Uh, thank you very much for being with us for this celebration of Michael. We've had a fabulous day so far, and I'm very happy for you to be joining us. Thank you. Well, I'm very, very happy to be here too, and I want to thank you for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there's a little lag in the video, so I don't know how this is going to work. But uh, I, I thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, I'm happy to be here to honor Michael and his memory. The one thing about Michael that hasn't actually been mentioned, it's peripherally mentioned, but is that I always admired Michael's sense of our community. 
and his commitment to that community. So that those, all of those books and compendia that he put together uh, with the, with the uh, methods books and so on, those were all meant to serve the community and they served the community very, very well. And has been mentioned by several others, Michael's knowledge about Drosophila research, past and present, was, they say, encyclopedic. Uh, you know, in modern parlance, maybe that's Wikipedic. Uh, if you wanted to know something, uh, you could just ask Michael, and he could, if he didn't know it for a fact, he could uh, tell you where to go and who to ask. And uh, I like to think of Michael as being Google before there was Google. So I want to talk about Flybase, but maybe in kind of a different way than, than well, apparently from what Jerry said, a different way than what Jerry thought. I want to talk about the birth of Flybase, and how it all started, and one particular aspect of Flybase, which is sometimes not appreciated very much, but is nonetheless very important. Um, the other thing I want to say about Flybase is, is through Michael's influence, and we all agreed when we were doing this, is that everything in Flybase should be open source and free. The, the data, the any underlying uh, tools for querying that data, everything is free to anybody who wants it. And it makes me wonder why we have all these bots attacking Flybase nowadays, because all they got to do is ask and they can have everything. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. I hope this works. Uh, and I put together slides that are a little more pedantic than the others, because since I'm not there physically, these are sort of uh, notes so that you can follow along with what I am talking about. So I'm going to do share screen, desktop, share. OK. There's my first slide. I hope you can all see it. Okay, thank you. So in 1992, uh, the, the second version of the Red Book came out and that's Dan Lindsley and Georgiana Zim's second version. The first version, Lindsley and Grell, uh, came out about 24 years before that. And the antecedent of Lindsley and Grell was Bridges and Bremi, which came out in 1944 and that's 48 years before. So that kind of reproduction time for a listing of all of the genes, aberrations, and maps in the fly was just not consistent with the, the speed with which the field was changing. Dan knew that. He's, and of course, he was, he was sort of burned out from trying to badger people in the community to contribute uh, their personal uh, material to the book. And so with growing complexity and, and not getting the sufficient uh, cooperation from some of us, including me, uh, so while they were still in the throes of putting together Red Book number two, he moved to try to create a new model. And that happened in 1989 when the Drosophila Research Conference was held in New Orleans, Louisiana. Dan approached Kathy Matthews, who was co-PI with me at the Bloomington Drosophila Stock Center, and said, let's put together an informal workshop to discuss the future of the Red Book. And the reason he approached Kathy was that he knew that the BDSC had put its stock holdings into an electronic database, and it made its holdings public uh, on what was then the early version of the World Wide Web on Indiana Bio Archive. At the workshop, uh, Dan said that this should be the way to move forward. 
and that should be the successor to the Red Book, and it could be more easily updated, and, and it could be a group of people that would maintain this. The end of the meeting, Dan Hartle and Michael were uh, asked and volunteered to organize a subsequent more in-depth workshop uh, that would be independent of the fly meeting. And in December of 1990, that workshop was held. Uh, Dan put it together. It was when Dan was not at Harvard at the time. He was, uh, he, he was in, at, uh, in St. Louis. And we had this meeting in this dingy, horrid little room in the basement of the Ramada Hotel on Wisconsin. And uh, so the right of the slide, you see those were the people who presented. Uh, Dan gave the opening remarks, and we had a discussion of databases. Uh, we had a presentation of uh, the Nematode database, uh, ACEDB. Uh, Jim Estelle from NCBI talked about what was available there. Um, and then there were some other things. Uh, John Merriam talked about some material he had. I'll have more to say about that in a second. Michael talked about uh, it, one of his favorite topics, which was chromosome inversions and, and chromosome breaks. Uh, Doug Brutlock talked about the Red Book database, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that. I talked about stock center material, and Alan Spradling talked about P insertions. Well, at the end of this, uh, we agreed that there should be a group of us that would put together another meeting and actually organize something formal for uh, uh, to move forward with a grant proposal. So the volunteers that uh, would propose to meet subsequently, Michael, of course, was an obvious choice. He had a large flat file database of genes and aberrations that were published after 1989 because Dan and Georgiana stopped putting new material into the Red Book in 1989. He also had control uh, or was associated with the Cambridge Offprint collection and had access to current, bibli uh, current bibliography of Drosophila literature. And I'll have more to say about that in a second. So this is on the right-hand side here, uh, an example of Michael's database of genes and aberrations. Kathy and I had the relational database of stock center data and we had a public site that could be used here at Indiana uh, Bio. John Miriam at UCLA had put together clone data from published walks. Remember, this is before the sequence of the genome. So this was uh, material that was available from walks, which were mentioned, and uh, various and sundry clones and clone collections. Bill Gelbart at Harvard and uh, the fourth of the volunteers, uh, Bill and Fotis had, Fotis's name has come up previously, and submitted a proposal to develop an electronic database uh, for Drosophila workers in 1987. Unfortunately, the proposal wasn't funded, but Bill had experience with and contacts at the human genome uh, section and NCBI that could help with any new proposal. We also recruited uh, Dr. Carolyn Tolstashev at NCBI, uh, who brought expertise with database and design, and importantly served as a kind of in-house in -house, uh, guidance counselor or sanity checker when we started going offline for things. And she put together one of the initial integrated Drosophila database formats. So we had our first meeting and one of the things that I always found was interesting is that the, that first meeting was held in a facility, one of the oldest bi buildings on the NIH campus uh, that was previously a convent. So I thought, I thought that I felt, uh, have always felt that the birth of Flybase took place in a convent. That's interesting. So we discussed the content of the database, where we would get the required data, and the type of database we would use. 
On points one and two, we all pretty much agreed. On the last point, uh, there were two conflicting opinions. One was, let's just use ACE-TB. The other was that we should use a, some commercially available system that had ongoing support. Carol and Tolstoshev argued strongly that we should use something like Sybase. And when she said Sybase, several people in the room said, wow, yeah, we can call it Flybase. And that settled it. So we went with Sybase as an as a underlying uh, database format. So we planned and wrote a proposal, which was submitted to, to NCHGR in October of 1991. And the initial Flybase NIH grant was funded and began July 1st, 1992. Those were the PIs and co-PIs listed on the grant. So what, what was in it? Well. We had Lindsley and Zim as an electronic version because the print version of that book uh, started off as, uh, as an electronic version and we could use that to parse out the information. The Ashburner genes and aberrations files, which were essentially an update of the second red book. The clone files from John Miriam, the Bloomington stock list, and Drosophila bibliographies. And I'll have something more to say about Drosophila bibliographies in a moment. So the first public version of Flybase appeared in 1992. And on the right-hand side of the screen, that's what the website looked like. So the way you got at the data was by Gopher and FTP. And it was from a Bloomington Stock Center server. And then we set up servers at other places around the world as well. The content of that first version was a lot of files. And the, those, those files and, and types of data uh, are listed in what I think, and Rachel can correct me if I'm wrong, was the first publication in development written by Michael and Rachel uh, to to start uh, and announce publicly the existence of Flybase. We had our first physical meeting in 1993 in Bloomington. Everybody flew in and this is the group. The people from Cambridge, I don't know if you can see my pointer, there's Michael, of course. I don't know why Michael and I are dressed alike, but it's, that's what it is. There was Nelly, and Aubrey, and Eddie, and one of the very important members of the Cambridge group that's missing is Rachel, because she, Rachel was at home having a child, so she couldn't make the flight. So there's John Miriam, Kathy Matthews, Carolyn Tolstoshev, and the various and sundry other members, and there's Bill Gelbart. So, the Red Book had exhaustive list of genes and aberrations. It did not include any formal literature cited. There were citations, but they didn't, there was no list of the references. Well, Michael's association with the Cambridge Offprint Collection, the familiarity with online listings, made him an ideal member of the Flybase team to lead a group to remedy this problem. We needed to have a list. He developed ways to retrieve in bulk listed publications on Drosophila that were electronically available. And his group at Cambridge established protocols for creating the, uh, curating the data in these papers and linking the information therein to genes, alleles, and other entities in the Flybase database. This worked famously for the current literature and going forward, and many of the tools developed early on have been enlarged upon and improved, improved as literature curation, curation has evolved. He also, and I can't, I can't stress this enough, he had the good taste and insight to assemble an absolutely first-rate team at Cambridge that did this work. 
And that group at Cambridge has changed over the years, but the high quality of the group of people who do this has not changed. He also saw to it that Go annotation, which we heard about from Susanna, was incorporated into the Flybase curation effort so that the genes and entities in Flybase could have Go annotation to make it easier to associate with other databases. Now, Drosophila had a long history prior to these public literature databases. And no Flybase literature compilation in Flybase would be complete without these past references. But there was no electronic version of this. These things were all in books. Okay. And the, the, starting with Morgan Bridges and Sturdivant, uh, it had become a tradition in the Fly community to collect all of the references that were published in any given year. And uh, Muller carried on that tradition and then passed that on to Herskowitz. Uh, and those books here could be used. Now, all of these things, there they were on paper. Flybase had to scan those in and then this, the situation with OCR back in those days was not so great. And so it, they all had to be fixed up so they were readable and put them into a normal reference parsable form. And, and that was, it was a one-off, true, but it was a Herculean effort. It was enormous to do this job. And Rachel, thank you. Well, Michael being Michael, he didn't stop there. He had all of this. He wanted to find the very first Prosophila publication. And of course he did. And there it is. That's not a typo, 1684. So I dredged up my old Latin from high school. And the title of the paper is about the fly that arises from wine or beer as it grows sour. And here it is in Latin with a smattering of Greek. And this, I think, must be the first literature figure of Drosophila that ever existed. And I have a proposition to this audience. For those of you who are working in flies, in memory of Michael and for all of that that we are indebted to him. In your next paper, grant proposal, or public offering, find a way to cite this paper. You can find it in Flybase under not, 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 not one. And I think Michael would find it amusing. And, you know, I know Michael and I spent hours partaking of these things that grow sour before they grew sour. I won't have anything to say, sorry, Jerry, about the incorporation of all the molecular data and the genetic maps and, and so on into Flybase, but that took place later. And this is a picture that was taken of the PIs, if you will, of Flybase uh, at that point and during that process. And these were happier times. And when I look at this picture, which I have stuck on my desk. It makes me sad as well as happy. So, because those are my friends. So I think I can stop my screen sharing now. And here I am back again. And I just want to say that Michael's contributions to our field and our endeavors were enormous and uncountable almost. There, there are just so many things that he did. We would be in a far poorer place without his efforts for the community and on our behalf. We are much the better for his presence amongst us and 
We are the lesser for his passing. I am sad to see him go. So we can't say enough good things about Michael. So I think we can stop this now and go back to your home screen. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. That was, that was absolutely fantastic trip down Merrily. I realise now where the John Merriam, uh, Merriam Memorial hard drive, uh, uh, disk drive property of UCL came from. It's where he was working. I'd forgot about those chromosome marks, so thank you for reminding me. And again, thank you yet again for reminding us of Michael's enormous contributions. Thank you, Tom. I think uh, we shall now, before we move to any general comments from the floor, invite Ken, Ken Siddle, who's uh, been a long time fellow of church, I won't, em church, I won't embarrass you by saying how long, uh, to come and say a few words about Michael's time at Churchill. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. I must say, I, uh, I feel extremely humble following in the footsteps of uh, such eminent speakers who've had such warm words to say about Michael from very personal and professional um, interactions with him. And I shall just say a few words about um, what I hope Churchill did for Michael and in return what Michael did for Churchill. I can say that Churchill has bestowed upon Michael one of the great honors he didn't receive in his lifetime in that the college circular notice of his passing um, regretted the loss of Sir Michael Ashburner. <laughs> and I found that mildly amusing as an error because it occurred to me that, I don't know, Francesca might correct me if I'm wrong, but had the offer of a knight had ever been um, made to Michael, I don't doubt he would have refused it. <laughs> anyway, Michael um, came up to Cambridge and to Churchill College in 1961, aged 19, with a college exhibition, which in plain English is a scholarship. He was one of the very first cohort of undergraduates at Churchill who were admitted in that its foundation year. I'd always assumed that his choice of Churchill reflected his naturally progressive nature, um, but by his own account, which I read in the Archive Centre last week, and which I think you can read um, later if you wish, he only applied to Cambridge to please his father, um, who put him down for entrance exams at Trinity, where else? Um, but it seems Trinity didn't want him, um, but fortunately, with great foresight, Churchill picked him up for their first intake. At the end of his second year, after he'd failed to secure a place to read part two zoology, I think someone already referred to that, um, Michael's tutor, Richard Adrian, and um, a zoology fellow, Martin Wells, who'd taken Michael under his wing, suggested that he should instead read genetics. In fact, he was one of just five part two genetics students that year, four of them from Churchill, and the rest is history. Also at the end of his second undergraduate year, of course, Martin Michael married Francesca, um, not without initial opposition, it should be said, from both the college and his family. Having obtained his BA in Natural Sciences in 1964, Michael went on to do a PhD in genetics. Um, he confessed that he had actually wanted to work with Sidney Brenner, goodness knows why, um, but it was under the nominal supervision of Alan Henderson and the substantial influence of John Thode that he began what he called his career in flies. When Michael obtained his PhD in 1968, Churchill College again played a hand in his career development, this time with their decision not to select him for a junior research fellowship. 
Instead, Michael accepted an invitation to, from Herschel Mitchell to do a postdoc in Caltech. After a productive year at Caltech, Michael returned to Cambridge in 69, but it wasn't until 1980 that his old college elected him to a senior research fellowship. Even so, he was the first former undergraduate of Churchill to become a fellow of the college. A decade later, he was also the first former undergraduate of Churchill to be elected a fellow of the Royal Society. Um, taking the history forward, the maximum tenure of our senior research fellowships is 10 years. So in my, 1990, Michael was elected to an extraordinary fellowship, which is the college's category of convenience for those who don't easily fit into any other category. <laughs> then in 1991, having been appointed to a university professorship in biology, Michael became a professorial fellow of the college. Finally, in 2011, on his retirement from his university position, he completed his collection of fellowship categories with the election to a pensioner or emeritus fellowship. So going back to the early days and a little bit of notoriety, I'm not sure how much of this might have been referred to earlier by Cahir. Um, Michael's association with Churchill College began, in fact, with no little notoriety. During the summer of 1961, Michael and Francesca had been very active in the growing anti-nuclear movement in the UK. In fact, he'd already been found guilty on three separate occasions of charges of obstruction under an 1839 act and fined 20 shillings each time. Then, just before he came up to Cambridge in September 1961, he was arrested under the Public Order Act of 1936 for conspiracy to riot and affixing a poster to private property. That was actually the Conservative Party central office. <laughs> without their permission. Actually, he'd been helping to promote a public demonstration in Trafalgar Square on behalf of the Anti-Nuclear Committee of 100, um, but in defiance of a Metropolitan Police banning order. It was the largest of a series of ban the bomb demonstrations that occurred around that time. At Bow Street Court in London on the 6th of October 1961, which would be pretty much Freshers' Week, um, he pleaded guilty to both charges along with four co-conspirators. It seems there was a very real prospect of him being sent to jail for the more serious Trafalgar Square offence. And his tutor, Richard Adrian, wrote to his father with an assurance that, if necessary, books could be sent to him in prison so that he could continue his studies. In the event, with the assistance of a very persuasive barrister, he escaped with a further fine of two pounds. I should say that the documents from which I've taken most of this information are on display today, and I hope you'll take the chance to look at them if you haven't already done so. And indeed, if anyone has further details of these exciting times, then I'm sure the Archive Centre will be very pleased to hear about them. Thereafter, however, Mike seems to have led a fairly blameless existence as a Churchill student, unless Francesca knows differently. Um, it seems that as an undergraduate, he wasn't always the most diligent of students, um, hence the... Um, zoology department's lack of enthusiasm for him, having consulted their records of practical class attendance. <laughs> and Michael himself confessed on the evidence of a um, college bill he'd long kept to having spent more on drinks in the buttery than on food in the dining hall. As a graduate student, he lived with Francesca in the college flats, where he much enjoyed the society of his fellow students and overseas visiting fellows such as George Gamow, the famous physicist. Although Michael was innately an immensely social individual, I suspect that the relative formality of College High Table was not completely to his taste, even the relative informality of Churchill High Table. And with his many other commitments, he was not the most visible of fellows in college. 
And as a research fellow and then a professorial fellow, he had no teaching obligations for college. However, he was very diligent in his involvement in college affairs, a regular visitor to the SCR, and a vocal participant in meetings of the governing body. It's rumored he served on the college hanging committee for a while. If so, I mischievously wondered if he knew before he joined just what sort of hanging he was getting involved in. Um, there also is a recollection of him being on the fellowship electors, which seems more plausible but I've not been able to verify either of these. Many fellows remember, <coughs> <pardon me. coughs> the entertaining and largely autobiographical postprandial talk <coughs> Mike gave to the fellowship in 1994, a transcript of which happily survives in the college archives. Among other rem reminiscences, Gahan Amaratrunga, a senior engineer, has a lasting memory of being patiently and enthusiastically educated in the SCR on why Drosophila was an ideal model to understand the human genome, recalling that it was one of his first experiences of learning about something completely new through informal conversation with a Churchill colleague. Another Gahan memory was Michael making a case for the college having a special association with the EMBL and the EBI, soon after it was decided to locate it in Cambridge, though it seemed that never came to pass. In a similar vein, Tim Cribb, a former postgraduate tutor, recalled Mike's involvement in a project with Janelia Farm to set up an exchange scheme for Cambridge, um, with Cambridge for research students. Michael promised to do this, proposed to do this under the collegiate aegis of Churchill, and there was talk of buying a house on Story's Way to accommodate the visitors. But sadly, that all dissolved when Mike became ill and could no longer pursue it. But it was characteristic of his always thinking how others would benefit from his active interventions. My own most vivid memories are bookends to my recollections of interactions with Michael um, in the, over three decades or more. In the late 70s, before either of us were fellows of the college, and when I lived in Lode, a village outside Cambridge, I recall visiting the Royal Oak pub in the next village of Swaffham Bulbeck, actually the commercial end of Swaffham Bulbeck. A small bearded gentleman was loudly holding forth at the bar, pint in hand, on some topic of the day. I quietly asked who this local character might be to be told it was Michael Ashburn, um, a name actually familiar to anyone who worked on the Downing site in those days. In fact, Michael and Francesca lived in the village at that time, um, just across the road, I think, from the pub. And once they'd moved into Cambridge, the cub, pub was forced to close. <laughs> Then, many wonderful conversations later, I recall a meeting of the governing body in 2012 that I think Cahir may have alluded to, which Michael attended, though at the time he was far from well, especially to express his vigorous opposition to the college's creation of a Nazarbayev University Fellowship to support a visiting scientist from Kazakhstan um, but also de facto honoring the country's dictatorial president. The passion of Michael's argument played no small part in convincing the governing body to reverse the prior decision of College Council and withdraw approval of the scheme as a stance in supporting human rights. And it is, I have to say, for his unwavering principles and the passion with which he defended them as much as his reputation as one of the foremost geneticists of his day, that Michael will be long remembered in Churchill. As Tim Cribb said to me, yes, he was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Francesca's got a whole box full of um, 
<laughs> These criminal records of Michael's. <laughs> and some of her own, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've kind of come to uh, the end of the formal section here. And I don't know if anyone... I, I put this in because, you know, it's a celebration. And I, I wonder if anyone would like to come up and say a few words at all. If not, that's fine. We can... We can close it off, but I give this opportunity uh, for anyone from the floor. We can bring you a microphone. Surely someone must have off-coloured jokes they want to tell about Michael. Or what an influence they've had in their career. What I will say is we've heard um, uh, throughout the day, uh, not only of Michael's scientific contributions and uh, his visionary work uh, across a number of different fields and, 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 and seeing further than others uh, uh, and being in the ground floor in terms of computational biology and, and, uh, and databases, but also about his incredible uh, support for everyone. He was a super humble man, despite what all he achieved in, uh, in his career, everything he achieved, he never was one for putting himself forward to take credit for. Absolutely no. You know, Francesca would have thrown him out if he'd accepted um, an offer of a knighthood, which he would never have done anyway. Um, he was a humble man. Sarah. Thank you. Good. Let's have a little cue then. So, I mean... I'm not sure when I first met Michael, but I think I will speak about when I was wanting to move back to Cambridge. And he was um, very welcoming and very helpful. I mean, he, he tried to convince me not to take my job, actually, <laughs> more because I think he wanted to give me more of an open opportunity to pursue different things. And he thought I'd have to work too hard in a university lectureship, which is what I took up at that point. Um, but he was great. I mean, he introduced me to John Root. I remember meeting John, and he'd said to me he'd fix me up with a bit of fly food and stuff so I could do my fly stuff. Um, and um, uh, he was just generally welcoming. There were these wonderful meetings in London, which I also remember, which somebody mentioned earlier on, which took place on Saturdays. We'd show up at uh, Imperial, go to the top of the biochemistry building, and, and there'd be kind of rather disordered array of things, and Michael would kind of go, Bray, Sarah, I think maybe you should talk today, so you'd have to go and put your name on the board <laughs> and come up with something to talk about. Um, so that was a wonderful introduction, and I think he, he was very supportive and very encouraging and also very critical because actually many, those who know me well will also know that my genetics is not very good, and uh, there were occasions when he would say, surely, Bray, I must have taught you in a part two lecture, and I said, no, I didn't do part two genetics, Michael. He goes, oh, okay, then, it's all right if you, if you don't know about inversions and all these kind of things. Um, and the other thing I was remembering, actually, was another challenge that we all faced, um, um, which some of you may recall, which was when the MRC had this wonderful idea that actually you could only apply for grants if you were part of a cooperative. This was a great scheme they had. And this actually was uh, devastating for, for many of us. Um, and um, somehow, I don't, Michael and I got together as uh, trying to put this forward, forward for Cambridge, that we were going to be the centre of you know, genetics fly genetics in some way and solve human disease as we do when we do fly genetics. And we wrote the cooperative grant, which actually um, went forward, and so all of us in Cambridge were able to continue doing our fly work, and there were many of you who were part of that as well, so it wasn't just Michael and I, but I do remember sitting in his office and trying to sort of, as, as uh, others of you have said, he would sort of write, you know, as he was talking and start putting the whole thing together so that it emerged, and, you know, instantaneously almost from his, from his um, uh, computer as we went. Uh, and so, yes, that was also a really important part of us all, all being a community here in Cambridge and able to continue with our fly work at this very interesting phase um, uh, in, in, in the MRC history. So um, that was a sort of, um, I wanted to get up here partly because I have such good memories of Michael and he was always very supportive. He did also have a bad habit, I would say, <laughs> of muttering very loudly to you sometimes when you're at conferences and you're desperately trying to listen to a talk and he would sort of start <laughs> and you're like <laughs> and you're like, oh, God, try um, uh, so that, that was also make us all laugh from time to time um, and had, of, of course, wonderful stories um, um, at, that kept us all uh, inspired um, in, you know, in many, many different ways. So um, thank, thanks, thank you very much, Michael, for, for being a very important part of a, a very a critical time in my career and for sp supporting all of us here in Cambridge uh, so much um, uh, uh, in so many different ways and of course across the world as well. Thank you.
So I'm Ilan Davis, and funnily enough, I'm from Glasgow now, yeah. even though I don't sound Glaswegian. Uh, so um, I was an undergraduate in genetics in 1986, and I did my undergraduate project, part two project, in Michael Acom's lab that was uh, jointly or mixed in with Ashburner's lab. I tend to call him Ashburner because that's what everyone called him then, not Michael. Um, <laughs> and um, I think it's fair to say, and I think uh, Mike Aiken will, uh, <laughs> will back this up. I wasn't exactly the most dedicated undergraduate um, because I was always kind of going off. I didn't do any science in the summer as you were supposed to. I was always going off on expeditions and rock climbing and hitchhiking across Tibet and everything else I did. So when I came to the lab, I wasn't exactly ready. And I remember, so I hope you don't mind me telling this story, Michael. <laughs> At one point, I said, mm, maybe I should do a PhD. And Michael took me aside and sort of rather... Um, tried to be subtle, but it wasn't very subtle, <laughs> told me, you know, science is not really much fun if you're not successful. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of um, did, sort of took the hint, and then I went to the careers office and started looking at what alternatives there might be, and I actually applied to be a guide on the Galapagos, um, but I wasn't accepted. <laughs> And then Michael, actually, I, I have to say, I found him terrifying as an undergraduate because his mind was worked so fast and he spoke so fast and mumbling and my mind is so slow, um, was then and still is, that I found it difficult to keep up. And so in his lectures, genetics lectures, they were really profound, and I could tell they were amazing, and I actually loved Drosophila, and I've been a Drosophila <laughs> geneticist ever since. Um, I've only worked in Drosophila, in fact, because I love Drosophila from, from the moment that um, I learned genetics in, in my part two in, in the lab. And he was, um, shall we say, kind of more forgiving of not so great undergraduates, and he he actually offered his office for me to talk to um, Phil Ingham, who I think is in the audience. Yep, I don't know if you remember Phil. Uh, so Michael suggested I should go into the office when I mentioned I wanted to, to do a PhD and suggested I should apply to David Ish Horowitz, who, is he still in the audience? Yep, David's still there. And um, then, he, because Phil was visiting and told me, you've got to talk to Phil, go into my office. And then Phil kind of told me what David was like and I encouraged me to apply to David. And actually, David was also quite forgiving of not very dedicated undergraduates because I think he, David and Michael had in common that they kind of weren't so dedic such dedicated undergraduates. So they could kind of see that you could become a scientist without being incredible from, you know, from birth. <laughs> uh, like some people I know are, but you know, there's lots of different kinds of scientists and lots of different diversity and that's good. So I kind of feel, I've always felt I owe Michael's gratitude for <laughs> enabling me and encouraging me to be a, to do a PhD, even though it wasn't that obvious I was going to be really any good at it. Um, and um, <clears throat> actually, over the years, as I became a more dedicated <laughs> scientist and I started, um, I would bump into to Michael Ashburner from, from time to time, and he, he would kind of always show an interest and ask, what are you doing now? <laughs> And um, I still found him intimidating. 
months, years later, <laughs> uh, somehow that was set in my mind. But thank you. Um, I just thought I'd share that with you. I'm, I'm, my name is Peter Lawrence. I am more or less a contemporary of Mike Ashburner, so I've known him all my scientific life, which is more than 60 years, full-time research, both of us messing about anyway. And I'm trying to think what might be something that hasn't been mentioned about him. And one I've come up with when I've been sitting there worrying about this is the fact that he, he has a great capacity for giggling. And... <laughs> I remember two occasions when, th when this happened, and I look back on it with great pleasure. One was, was the very first Crete meeting in 1976, which occurred in Heraklion uh, Fort, underground, in a kind of stony cavern. And we were sitting in there, and there was a, somebody will remember who this German person who invented in situ hybridization with RNA was. I can't remember his name, but he was giving us the... Sorry? Can't hear, sorry. No, 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 before Dieter Taus. Ling, it's him. I think his name began with S. David, remember. Anyway, were you there at 76? But do you remember this talk where this guy was one of these high, it was a high tech meeting, which meant there were wires going in all directions. In those days, it didn't have anything that was wired, so everybody had to be mic'd. And this, this guy was mic'd, and also the chairmen were mic'd, the speakers were mic'd, and there were wires all over the place. And he had a tendency to, uh, when he was giving his talk, to move about. And as he moved about with the mic, it got tangled up with other mics. <laughs> and it went round and round. <laughs> Until he was unable to move. <laughs> The chairman then got tangled up. <laughs> the chairman, the chairman got out of wires. And the whole thing, and it was, so that's one memory I had of him. And he was completely unable to move with the giggles. So that's one occasion. Another occasion I remember him in fetal position was when Antonio Garcia Bolido drove us to Toledo. Oh, it was a rather dangerous road then. This was also in the 70s. And Michael was on the back seat, and I was unfortunately in the front seat. And Antonio's driving was, what should we say, very Spanish. And at that time, I know they're civilized now. But, and and M Michael was terrified. And again, he was in the fetal position in the back seat. Now, another occasion when we got to giggles was also at Crete. Because there's a swimming place, a rather rocky swimming area down below the Crete meeting. And uh, he, Michael, would often go swimming there. And... You know, he, has, he had a sort of shape. And one of the problems was that when he was swimming flat on the sea, there was a lower area which was, which was in danger of being beached. <laughs> on, a, on a one famous occasion, uh, Michael beached there and couldn't move neither forward nor backwards. <laughs> and everyone very much enjoyed this. So the point was, those, that was the, one of the very early meetings. All the meeting at that time consisted of restriction maps. Jerry, I don't know whether you were there and remember that, but there was almost entirely restriction maps. And there's nothing more boring than restriction maps. <laughs> People would go up and say, you know, I'm now cloning this region, and we've got a band site here, and that road was open, and another one there, and it went on and on, one talk after another. And then I did, I did a little drawing of Michael beaching. 
And this drawing was passed around, and again, the whole meeting completely collapsed. And it was led, the giggling was led by, by Ashburner, who was once more in this fetal position, curled up on his seat, unable to move. So now. And then there's another aspect of his I've been thinking about, which hasn't come up, which is he was very competitive. And over our long association, which as I've said goes back 60 years, he and I were always competing. We had devised little competitions. For example, again, at the Crete meetings, each of us counted the references to us in the meeting <laughs> with the aim of beating the other. Well, I, never had any, I was never anywhere near. Ashburner won the damn thing every time. <laughs> and he never, he never for a moment thought we shouldn't have the annual competition for that one. <laughs> and then there was another occasion where we were pulling collecting mushrooms, and we were collecting uh, parasol mushrooms, Lepiota procera, um, a little earlier than this in the time of year, it would be September, October. And the competition was to see, to see who would collect their own volume in these <laughs> mushrooms. And I'm sorry to say that Ashburn had won again. <laughs> and another lifelong competition that we had was to see if we could get persuade anybody to name any insects after us. And after having done all kinds of nefarious activities, I thought, I'm going to beat Ashburn on this one. Because I got, thanks to a, a friendly insect taxonomist in, in zoology, Henry Disney, I got two obscure tropical beetles named after me. Because I was only going to get one name, but he, I, got, I got two of them. I can't even remember what they were called. So they still exist, I'm sure, I hope so, anyway. And then Ashburn got me because he got Drosophila named after him. And if you read his book, you'll see uh, in there, he refers to, as he described as himself, a euphoniously named, named Drosophila Ashburnai. So I lost that one as well. I think I lost them all. But it was, it was, a, it was a long and, uh, I should say, sustaining friendship, as uh, Pooh would put it. And uh, I'm very grateful to have known him and uh, miss him a lot. Good afternoon. So I am, um, when I worked with Flybase, I arrived and I met Michael at the tender age of 20. And I can tell you, he was jolly intimidating. And he also told me I didn't work. I applied for a job in John Root's lab because he's an excellent guy to know. And um, he basically said, you don't want this job. And I thought, you're so rude. You're so unkind. I'm, I'm standing here trying to look very encouraging and I really, really want to do this job. Of course I want to do this job. He said, no, you know, you don't want to come. I'll, I'll, t I'll talk to you in a month. And it's like, okay. And you walked away so disgruntled and unhappy. And it's like, I don't understand what happened just then. Very confusing, but he was writing a job, uh, uh, sorry, a grant application for Flybase, for a biocurator. Before biocuration was particularly a role, we were, I can't remember what we were called, scientific something or others, but I had the pleasure of working with Rachel and Aubrey and Michael, and Mike, as it was, if you sent him an email, he would always write Tar M, which was lovely, because you knew he'd read it. There's so many emails you write that no one even acknowledges. So, you know, I always thought that was really sweet. But also, he's been so instrumental in my career. So, Rolf, you came and gave a talk at Department of Genetics, and, and Mike said, you must talk to him. It's like, okay. <laughs> Thinking, why? Why do I want to talk to this tall German man? And it turns out I ended up then working with Rolf at um, Uniprot. So, you know, and Michael, again, was part of that. So when I was at the UBI, he's sitting there working away diligently, of course, because Rolf was always around, and suddenly someone will come and massage your shoulders. It's like, oh, my goodness. And you just melt into his hands. Cause, and everyone's going, who was that? And it's like, well, that was Michael. And it's like, yes, but who is he? It's like, he's actually part of the EBI, but you don't recognize him. And I do feel that at the EBI, he wasn't always understood. Department of Genetics, everyone knew who he was, knew who amazing, an amazing person he was. I'm not sure he got that recognition at the EBI, which is such a shame, because it was well-deserved. As we just learned listening to Graham, you know, he did so much. And I have to admit, I've learned, I didn't know he did half of those things. So thank you for that education. That was really good. So the one thing I wanted to mention is um, one of the Flybase meetings, because, I mean, Flybase was a great opportunity for me. I was very young, and I got to fly to the States every year, got to go to Europe every year. Honestly, just eye-opening, really fantastic. But one of my favourite was we went to a monastery, 
couple of foundation does something. Thank you. Oh my goodness, that was one of the best meetings. We all had a, so you got paired up, a Brit and an American. You got in the house each, you had a car each. The cars had a stick shift, so the Europeans, the Brits, had to drive the Americans around. It was hilarious. And we'd be going up and down and around, and there'd be like these random art pieces, and if you walked around, you were crushing lavender under your feet. Honestly, absolutely amazing. But we had, it was, we had a, a photo, and they, they, wrote, um, they wrote a diary or something about our meeting, which was part of what we needed to do. And so Mike needed to write his name. He couldn't remember how many Fs were in Professor. And he giggled so much. It was one of these occasions he was on the floor, literally rolling in laughter, unable to spell his own name. <laughs> so that was, just, that was just one very fond memory. So thank you. I just want to share that. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Hi, I'm um, Steve. I'm um, Isabel's husband, Francesca's uh, son-in-law, and Michael was my father-in-law. So uh, early on in my in my relationship with his daughter, we went to the to the north of Scotland. I think Suzanne was saying about his um, bird watching and how it could sometimes overtake everything in his mind. So we were in the car he was driving, and I was a long way out of my comfort zone. I mean, I was a rock and roll stage manager, almost entirely nocturnal. I was in the middle of nowhere. I had no reference point. It was no context to me. But, you know, gazing out the window. And all of a sudden, the car stops. And he leaps out, saying something about a bird, something about some bird in the undergrowth. As I've turned around, I've realized he hasn't put the handbrake on. <laughs> so the whole car starts rolling back down the hill. And Michael's off across the field, <laughs> looking for one of these birds. Right? So it's a quick on with the handbrake. It was later discovered that at that time he was coming down with diabetes, which wasn't a particularly good time for him. He was, um, he, he was, he was ill at, but at that time. But the thing about him that, that stuck out for me was, and I've heard it referenced here obliquely several times, was that no matter who you were, he had time for you. He treated you as somebody of worth. You were never feeling belittled by his intellect or by his position or anything else. He always had time for you as, as a human being. And that's what I'd like to thank Michael for. It was simply for that, for being there for anyone and everyone when they needed him, really, I, I think. And doing it so well and so self-effacingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. I think that is actually very fitting words to, to, to draw an end, uh, a conclusion to today's things. Um, I just want to again extend my thanks uh, to our sponsors, Churchill College, for their generosity in hosting this event, providing with lots of stuff. EMBL, EBI, of course, uh, the Genetic Society, and University of Southern California, I think, through a grant uh, that Mike Cherry obtained representing the Gene Ontology Organization. Uh, uh, and, of course, the Department of Genetics. So uh, thank you, everybody. Again, many, many thanks to Super Lottie, for the organizational whiz kid that put everything together. Uh, um, and uh, particularly uh, to Rebecca, uh, to Rachel, of course, and to Kaha for all their help. And most of all, thank you all for coming to, to celebrate uh, the, uh, Michael's life. It's been a um, uh, uh, fabulous occasion and very uh, moving at times.